Now we're back to uh, back on planet Earth uh, with uh, entrepreneurs building the Internet of Things, and there is a, there, there, there is a team that I was extremely impressed by, um, and I was not alone to be impressed by them, as you will see. They have some, a bit of news actually during the the talk. So please help me welcome Smart Things, Jeff Haggins. Good morning, everybody. So after the last talk, I'm really happy that all we're doing is building a platform for the Internet of Things, because it seems way easier now after hearing Benjamin talk about what NASA did with the rover missions. So uh, my name is Jeff Hagens. I'm the CTO and one of the founders of Smart Things. And I want to talk to you this morning a bit about the idea of an open physical graph about bringing the world online. See, we believe that the physical world is merging with the digital world. And that done correctly, what this will do is to create a virtual representation of all of our physical devices online. We call that the physical graph. And done correctly, what that will accomplish is that it will allow us to make the physical world programmable. Because when we interact with the virtual representation of a device or a thing, the physical world will change in response. And when we interact with the physical world, the virtual world or the virtual representation will also change in response. We've had a lot going on over the last few months. We launched on Kickstarter back in August and very quickly had 6,000 backers who said yes to this vision. We committed to delivering more than 25,000 connected devices as part of our Kickstarter campaign, and we signed up more than 750 developers and makers to actually start creating and integrating with our platform. More importantly, we also connected with lots of consumers who are anxious for this as well. And we started getting ideas for them about what kind of applications they would like to see of this technology. That group submitted more than 2,000 different ideas for what they would like to do with this platform that we call SmartThings. We also went to Dublin to the Web Summit and ended up winning the startup competition there in Dublin. And that was really exciting because we were able to, to, to kind of, for the first time, talk to potential partners, talk to developers and makers, and to hear their ideas and to get feedback from them about what they would like to do with this platform. And that's really why we continue to come to shows like LaWeb and why we're going to be at CES in January in Las Vegas, is to continue to kind of engage with our three constituents, the consumers, the makers, and the developers that will ultimately make this platform a success. So let's talk for a minute about what we do and, and how we do it. We see things pretty simply when it comes to the Internet of Things. We believe that the Internet of Things has got to be built on a platform that is easy, intelligent, and open. Now, you, you'll say to me, well, that's, that, that sounds kind of obvious, doesn't it? No one, no one would build a platform that was stupid, you know, closed, and, and difficult. But it's not as obvious as it seems. When we say easy, what we mean is that it has to be easy for consumers. It has to resonate with them in terms of the problems that it's solving, but it also has to be easy to use. We've got to be able to take a kit of, of our SmartThings hub and devices and take it out of the box and start using it and get real tangible value out of that solution within, say, five minutes. It's got to be easy for makers and developers as well. It's got to be intelligent in the sense that we believe that the paradigm for the Internet of Things that will be successful is one where we apply applications to our physical devices. Not, not just the applications that the device manufacturer wanted you to have, but applications that can be written by an ecosystem of developers who can access an open platform and create these applications. 
We all know how to install an application under iOS or Android, and the same paradigm is really what's going to make the Internet of Things be successful. And finally, it needs to be open. Open in terms of technology standards. For example, our Smart Things Hub is supporting Zigbee, Z-Wave, Wi-Fi, eventually Bluetooth, so that we can connect any number of devices out there and let you automate your world using those devices. Right? It's got to be open for developers as well. It's got to be open for makers so that, that, so that the hobbyists, the makers, and the manufacturers can connect their own devices easily and effortlessly to this cloud that we call the Smart Things Cloud. So rather than talk about it anymore, I want to actually show you how it works. And in order to do that, I'm going to get a little bit of help from my team in Minneapolis, Minnesota. There they are. Hey, Jesse. Hey, Jeff. So, Jesse, why don't you introduce yourself and Scott? Yeah, so I'm Jesse. I'm a developer on the SmartThings platform. I'm uh, here today with Scott Vlamick. He's another developer on the platform. We're uh, here in lovely Minneapolis. Hi, Jeff. Hey, Scott. Thanks for helping me out today. So, Jesse, what do you have to show us there? Yeah, so we, uh, we took our hub out of its... Uh, so that you guys could see it here. Uh, and then if we go into the study, we've got a Z-Wave switch installed in the wall here. And back there in the corner is a Zigbee uh, pluggable outlet. So we've got we've multiple. Got a, few other, a few other surprises for you. All right. So we've got multiple protocol devices all there in the room. And I see that it looks like the Christmas tree is actually plugged into that Zigbee, in, uh, that Zigbee outlet. Is that right? That's true. So I'm going to actually use the SmartThings app, which everybody here at LaWeb can see. And uh, you can see that I've got a variety of different devices on my phone, uh, from switches, motion sensors, contact sensors, temperature sensors. You can see them all there. And the one in the top right is the Christmas tree. So let's actually turn on the Christmas lights from here. There we go. So It's not as hard as landing a rover on, on Mars. Um, so that looks great, Jesse, but I think it'll look even better if I turned off the overhead lights. So I'm going to do that as well. So there we go. Now we've got the, uh, the nice uh, view of the Christmas tree. And we can all tell from here at LaWeb that it is, in fact, still the middle of the night in Minnesota because it's dark outside. Um, so hey, Jesse, I just. It, I'm not sure everybody could see it here on the screen, but I just got a text message that says that my liquor cabinet was opened. What's, uh, what's going on there? Hey, Sc Scott, it's, it's like <laughs> 4 hey, o'clock in the morning for you, isn't it? Well, it's 5 o'clock somewhere. I, 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 I'm familiar with that expression. I don't think they meant 5 a.m. So, I suppose you're right. So, so, Scott, what just happened there? You, you have a contact sensor. I can see it on the cabinet there. But why did I get a text message? We've got a smart app installed so, that so, uh, sends a text message whenever this contact sensor I see. Sensor so opens. there's a smart app running on our platform that any developer could have actually written that got the event on the open close sensor and sent me a text message telling me that in this case, my, my unruly teenager is getting into the liquor cabinet. So, so that's, that's, that's pretty cool stuff. And I could actually take that same device and use it for something totally different right? by changing the smart app that's installed. That's right. So I'm going to do that. And you can see that I actually, here's, here's the text me when smart app. And it was configured for the liquor cabinet and to send me a text message. So I'm going to uninstall that. Then I'm going to go back to my devices here. And I'm going to install a different smart app. So let's go to convenience apps. And I'm going to install a, another really simple smart app, turn a light on when it opens. So we'll install that. And I'm going to configure it to use the same liquor cabinet and the Christmas tree. And I'm going to install that. So I've got that smart app installed, Scott. Now, so would you open the liquor cabinet door and let's see what happens? All right. So 
it's hard for every, everybody here couldn't actually see the liquor cabinet opening, but so you got to trust me, that's exactly what just happened. Scott opened the door and, uh, and the Christmas tree came on. So pretty cool stuff. So Scott, I, I see that the temperature sensor actually says it's 55 degrees in there. Is, is it really that cold? 55 Fahrenheit. No, that's up in the loft. The loft, where's the loft? Uh, the, there's a ladder to the loft uh, behind a secret door here hidden in the bookcase. Uh, you have a now secret door? How, I want a secret door in my house. <laughs> we built the latch mechanism for the door using an Arduino and our smart things shield. Uh, uh, we open the door we use it just by spinning this globe. Wait, so 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 you 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 built a latch mechanism using Arduino, using our which and a shield which we provide that has the module on it that allows that Arduino to connect into our cloud seamlessly without the without the maker actually having to do very much, right? And then how are you how are you making it work with the globe though? So we we installed our smart contact sensor in the globe, and we installed a smart app that responds to the closed events from the globe and sends a command to the Arduino to open the door. To open the door. So, and it's actually the device in the upper left-hand corner, I believe here, which is that contact sensor. And so if you rotate the globe now, or maybe it's the one in the middle, but we're, we're going to see. Oh, there, it's the one in the middle. It just went closed. And I could hear the click of the secret door. So you can actually now open the secret door. Is that right? So very cool. That's right. So that's a case where you know, not a professional device. Uh, you know, a maker could have taken our Arduino shield and done that exact same project just, just the way you do. Scott and Jesse, thanks so much for your help with this. Yeah, thanks, Jeff. Thanks, Jeff. All right, we'll talk to you guys later. So let's talk a little bit more about how we're going to support developers and makers. We have uh, three different things. So number one, IDE support. For developers, we're going to support both a web-based IDE that will allow developers to get in and actually create smart apps on our platform without having to install a desktop IDE or doing, do any of the typical stuff that they would have to do to write code. We're also going to ultimately support a desktop IDE as well for creating the kind of the bigger, more complex solutions that we know developers want to create. Then we have our thing module, which is a, a module that device manufacturers can install into their devices, integrate with it, and it will co both connect to our hub and therefore connect easily to our cloud, allowing device manufacturers to be smart things compliant very easily by just adding this chip into their solution. And then finally, our Arduino shield th that, as you saw, allows makers to prototype devices, but allows them to easily connect into the SmartThings cloud so that they can benefit from the same cloud solution and iPhone and Android experience that I just showed you. So I want to take a minute and actually show you, actually show you the web IDE. This is going to be the fastest IDE demo of all time because I only have 15 minutes for the whole presentation. So here is our web, web IDE. And the way to think of a smart app is that it really consists of uh, really three things. Number one, a set of declarations for what kinds of devices the application wants to make use of. I can see these at the top. I can see that it's asking for a contact sensor, a motion sensor, and a switch to turn on and off something. In this case, it says a light. And <clears throat> this declaration is ultimately actually used by the iPhone app in order to prompt the user. You saw me go through that experience when I installed the iPhone app. Then the application has to subscribe to some different events. It needs to, to, to receive events when things happen, right? And so we see that when it's installed, it subscribes to events on the contact sensor, and it subscribes to events on the motion sensor. And then finally, the application is a set of event handlers that actually respond to those events. You'll notice that this code looks a lot like Ruby. And it is a lot like Ruby. And that's going to make it very easy for developers, for web developers with really any skill set to be able to write smart apps quickly and easily. When you look at, for example, 
this opened event on the contact sensor, you'll see that it does some, some debugging, and then really it only does one thing, light.on. And that's really our vision for how simple and friction-free we want to make it for developers to create smart apps. There's nothing more that you need to know than light.on. It doesn't matter whether that's a Zigbee light, a Z-Wave light, a Wi-Fi light, right? Light.on is all you have to do. Or garage door.close is all that you have to do to interact with the physical world. So let's actually look at what happens with this app in the simulator. So it's actually simulating the iPhone experience, and I can configure which devices I want it to use. And then it's got a set of simulated devices here. And I'm going to turn this switch to an off state. And then I'm going to open this contact sensor. And you can see that the switch went on, right? Because that's what the app does. If I turn it to the off state and then simulate motion on the motion sensor, again, you'll also see it come on. So another part of our vision is that developers should actually be able to create Internet of Things applications even if they don't have the things. Right? As a developer, I should be able to write an Internet of Things application that interacts with the physical world, but I don't need the physical devices in order to be able to create that application. I can do it all with simulated devices, simulated switches, motion sensors, you know, whatever it is, garage door openers, thermostats, anything you want, I should be able to do it with a simulated device. And when I deploy that application into my real account for testing with real devices, it should just work. That's our vision. So we've been really busy. We've had a lot of, uh, a lot of interest, a lot of interest from, from consumers and developers and makers. But as you can imagine, we've also been busy with interest from potential investors. And I wanted to take the moment to make an announcement uh, ab along those lines. And that is that as of today, we've actually closed a $3 million seed round from some of, the, some of the most brilliant minds in technology investing in the world. And we are super excited to have a set of investors behind us that believe in our vision of bringing the open physical graph online. Now, what does that mean to you guys? What does it mean to developers and makers? Well, part of what we're going to do with that investment is to launch a contest for developers and makers. We want to encourage developers and makers to actually create solutions that bring the physical graph online, that integrate with our platform for new devices, but also the applications that will make use of those devices. So we're announcing our developer and maker contest. Uh, it, it, is, it is structured so that there are prizes for different categories of solutions, and then some grand prizes overall, with a total of $100,000 in cash prizes, but perhaps more importantly, exposure to very influential seed investors, help for the grand prize winners in, in planning their manufacturing and productizing their, their solutions. And we're super excited to have the contest uh, as something we're going to do very shortly. And the way that you can participate in that, or just to join in the conversation about smart things and about the Internet of Things, is to go to build.smartthings.com, sign up, join our community, participate in the conversation, and when it asks you uh, what groups you want to be a member of, check the box that says that you want to, be, uh, want to be part of the Smart Things Developer and Maker Contest, and that will get you into the contest so that you can start submitting your ideas for what you're going to do to bring the physical graph online. Thank you. Thank you, Jeff. That's, I, I have to tell the story on how I, I really make very few investments myself. Very few. And the way it happened is as I was building the web program, I invited you guys to speak. And then I got into it. And yes. I talked to you know, all the speakers, of course. And I got more into it. And two days ago, I emailed and said, can I put some money in as well? Because you know, this is so impressive. This and, is really cool. And, and uh, you know, we're certainly happy to have you participating along with all the others. Thank you, Jeff. Yeah, thank, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, <laughs>